it will be on Tuesday, March 19th, here at noon. And uh, Senator Fellow Chantal will be giving the lecture, What does quantum mechanics tell us about reality? And you're all invited to listen to his uh, talk. On Friday, March 22nd, we will have uh, the penultimate uh, uh, lecture in the annual lecture series given by physicist Nicole Younger Alhalper, who will be talking about field notes on the second law of thermodynamics from a quantum physicist. Uh, she, she, she has something called quantum punch. Is that the name of her of her lab? Yeah, something like that, which seems like a really interesting lab. I have a great website in any case. And the program for the last conference at the center, Revitalizing Science and Values, organized by Arnon uh, Levy, or Senior Leading Fellow of the Semester, will be taking, uh, is available online on the center's website. So please have a look at the program. All right, thanks for coming uh, uh, to uh, today's lecture. What I want to be talking about is uh, some work on obedience, and I have some uh, bad news to give you about all of you, so I hope you won't leave this room too uh, depressed. So let's suppose you uh, get an invitation to take part in an experiment, and you decide for the amazing amount of five dollars to go to that experiment, you enter the lab, and there are two people waiting for you. One is wearing a lab coat, which is obviously a uh, lab assistant or maybe a psychologist you don't really know, and one is uh, just like you wearing casual clothes, uh, another participant. You introduce yourself, uh, the, lab, the psychologist, the lab assistant gives you two, uh, randomly two paper, two pieces of paper that you must read. On yours, it's written teacher. On the other participants, it's written learner. All right, everybody gets the setting so far? So it means that you are going to be the teacher in a learning experiment. The other person is going to be the learner in this learning experiment. Right? This is the place where you are in, the room where you are in, actually. There's a weird table, you're going to be sitting on this chair, and in front of you there is this weird machine. Now, you go to the next room, and the first thing you do in the next room is you sit the other participant, the learner, on a chair with the help of the psychologist. And you put some electrodes on the person because you're told you're going to be, as part of the learning experiment, giving electric shock to that person. And then you leave the room and you go back to the main room, the room you enter to, and you sat and you, and you sit. All right? So that's going to be you, the learner that you had to sit a minute ago, and there's an experimenter here that is actually checking what you are doing. In front of you, you have this weird machine, which I've already showed you. It has uh, switches like that, that you can move up and down. You are explained that whenever you move a switch, the learner, the person in the other room, will receive an electric shock. And you can see they're grouped by four. The first one is something like very mild, even though I don't want to really read what's written. It goes to danger, severe shock. And then it goes to X, X, X. It's not a porn <laughs> website. <laughs> it just means it's just very bad. So, uh, and it goes from, uh, I think, 15 to 450, right? And so whenever the learner will make a mistake in the learning task, you will have to give him a reinforcement, a punishment to see whether his or her performance, his performance, the first experiment, improves as a function of the feedback, the electric shot, that the participant is given. All right, let me uh, show you very quickly uh, a video made by the psychologist. Although it may seem stronger because of the uh, electrode paste, which provides a perfect contact. So. All right, let's go on to our instructions. We will begin with this test. Uh, you will read each pair of words in this list once to the learner until you've read through the entire list. Direct your voice toward that microphone as the rooms are partially soundproof. After you've read through the list once, you'll go on to the next page. And here, starting from line A, you'll read the word in large letters, along with each of the other words in the line. For example, in the first line, you read blue, boy, girl, grass, hat. Now, after you've read the four choices, the learner pushes one of the switches on the board in front of him, and the number he has selected will light up in this box, one, two, three, or four. Now, if he gives the correct answer, you say correct and go on to the next line. The correct answer is underlined and is also indicated in the right margin. Yeah. 
If he were to indicate the wrong answer, you would say wrong. Then tell him the number of volts you're going to give him. Then give him the punishment. Then read the correct word pair once. And then go on to the next line. For example, if he indicates... Um, participants get to be quite reluctant to shock. When they say no, they don't want to shock, they get four prompts in a row, it's scripted. Uh, and the psychologist is slowly increasing, just saying, no, please continue, until you must continue. If after hearing must continue, the, the participant says, I want to leave, then the person is allowed, is allowed to leave. Right? And what you're measuring really here is how long participants are going to be, to be shocking the, the, um, the, the learner in the audience. Needless to say, the learner is not a real learner. Uh, it's a confederate. No one is getting shocked here. Um, but, but the person are still willing to do that. That says it was a 1930 experiment where people had to kill a, ch a, a live chicken. So it was a 1930 version. And, and there was a real live chicken. It was not a fake chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so there's uh, antecedents to that, to that study about obedience. Now, the question I want to ask you is, what would you do? So how many of you wouldn't shock until 4.50? <laughs> wait, 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 would not? Again? How many of you wouldn't would go stop. to the maximum? How many of you would stop before the end? <laughs> the end? Huh? How many of you would go to the end? Exactly. You were like totally deluded about yourself. <laughs> Was it was it Trump taking the cognitive test on the other? Side? I want to change my answer. I'm sure I'm the one who gets shocked. So the study, the study was taken to be revealing a phenomenon called um, uh, destructive obedience. The destructive obedience is the fact that under minimal constraint, namely here someone is just telling you, please continue. You must continue. There's no physical violence under minimal constraint, knowing that what they are doing is wrong. A large proportion of people are actually willing to cause harm to other people. This is a phenomenon of destructive obedience. Um, this is that phenomenon here that this gentleman here uh, uh, was illustrating for you a few minutes ago. Now, what I want to tell you a bit today, I will, I will tell you a bit more about the experiment, just giving you the basic framework and tell you about where it comes from. Then I can, I'll describe a very influential objection that has been raised against, that, against that study. <laughs> then we'll do a small detour to, to just around some issues around uh, the work by Milgram, and then we'll get. Wrong. Volts. 135. And it's a woman. N, white, cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong, 150 volts. Answer, horse. Continue, please. Go right on. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. The next word is sad. I'll make you going. Continue, please. Oh, no, sad. Sad. Face, music, clown, girl. Correct. Next one, short. Sentence, movie, skirt, Time. Answer, please. Wrong. Under 65 volts. Time. <laughs> Continue, please. Go on. All right. So the study I've, I've shown you earlier was uh, developed by uh, Stanley uh, Milgram, 1933. 1984. He's an extremely famous psychologist. If you don't, do not know him, he made several contributions to social psychology. You probably know that each of us, or believe that each of us is separated for, from someone else by seven degrees of separation. He's the one 
four? Six. 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 He's the one who did that experiment. Uh, you probably know the lost, the lost letter paradigm to measure altruism. He's the one who developed this experiment. So throughout his career, he made massive contributions to the development of social psychology. In a way that's very original, while social psychology nowadays takes place in a lab, it's very regimented. Much of his work, not all his work, was taking place in the wild, in natural experiments, trying to measure natural behavior. He's extremely influential, according to an article published in the Review of General Psychology in 2002, with the 47 most cited psychologists of the 20th uh, century. Um, in 1963, he published this article here, Behavioral Study of Evidence, in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology, JASP. It was his first, it was his first article. It reports a single experiment. By our modern standards, a very unusual article. It's very narrative. It's very exploratory. There's no hypothesis test. It reports just a strange phenomenon that he's been observing in his paper. It was a start of a series of studies where he made small variation on the experimental design I've, I've described to you earlier. 24 studies were completed. 18 of them were reported in his book in 1974, a very important book. I wanted to bring it to you today, but of course I forgot it at home when I left this morning. So I can't, I can't it's a wonderful book, it's short, uh, it's very well written. But that described 18 experiments, variation on the same, on the same experimental uh, design. Now let me tell you a bit more about the 1963 experiment. In 1961, Midram received his PhD from social psychology at Harvard. He got hired in 1960, just before getting his PhD by Yale, so you know, first, first job, quite prestigious position. And he starts teaching very quickly. Uh, one of the classes he teaches uh, in 1961 is this course with the undergraduates called Psychology of Small Groups. And there he develops new experiments to give psychologists a sense of how to use one-way mirror. He wanted to, to, to teach them how to use techniques, really. And as part of this experiment, he develops the basic structure of the obedience experiment I gave you earlier. And it works tremendously. The undergraduates are extremely excited. The results are shocking. So he decides to run it for real at Yale in 1961 uh, in the basement of uh, Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Chittenden Hall. He recruits 40 male participants. They're from the broader population. They're not undergraduates. The paper is quickly written, it's a very short paper, it's a very unusual, it's kind of a very casual, breezy uh, way of writing. Um, it's originally rejected by uh, the Journal of Personality, which is a leading journal in the field. It's submitted to a uh, Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology, which is also a good journal, slightly less, less prestigious than Journal of Personality. It's originally rejected, uh, but for some curious reason, I guess uh, Milgram was lucky. It's accepted <laughs> in 1962, and that's his first publication. Uh, just imagine you're making a first publication that's making you a world star. Uh, this is quite, quite, quite a lucky break. Um, in 1964, after a few things, which I'll tell you in a few, in a few minutes, he gets uh, the AAAS prize for behavioral science uh, research. He also gets an NSF uh, uh, award to actually carry the whole sequence of, of 18 studies that are the matter of the 1974, 1974 uh, book. I will use the word experiment to describe the 1963 studies that I will describe a bit more for now. It's not really an experiment. There's no control condition. You know, it's, just, it's just an observation of people's behavior in an artificial setting with one manipulation. Okay, we've already seen that picture. Just to remind you, this is a structure of the 1963 experiment, right? You hear, you, uh, you have, to, the learner is supposed to learn some association between words. When the learner is making a mistake, you're supposed to shock him. And as the learner makes mistakes, you're supposed to increase the intensity of the shock. When you say you want to stop, when you object, you're given four prompts. At the end of the four prompts, you can leave. The dependent measure is how long you keep from 50 to 450. Here are the results of the first studies. Uh, it's taken from uh, the paper, uh, the 1963 paper. At 300, as you can see, no one stopped before 300 votes. At 300 votes, in, the first, in that study, the first time the learner, the person in, in uh, the Confederate, mm -hmm. protests. So until before 300, no one protests. You're just choking and choking. At 300, the person asks, I want to leave. I want to stop. Only five people, only five people stop. 
And then he protests, then the learner stops protesting. We don't know what has happened to him. People keep going. 26 of the 40 participants go to 450. As you can see, they're all marked on the machine, XXX. It's written very clearly, danger, severe shock, extreme intensity shock, <laughs> intense shock, and so on and so forth. So that, that's the same study that's part of the book. See that from the book, that's a subset of the studies that Milgram has conducted. These are the first four studies. As you can see, you get variation in numbers depending on many factors, exactly what would you be expecting. Do you see the participants being shocked? Is a participant close to you? Is a psychologist calling you from a phone or through a phone? You know, so there's a lot of factors that influences people's disposition to obey. But in all of them, there's a, there's a very large proportion of participants who are willing under minimal constraint to cause harm, knowing that what they're doing is actually wrong. And that's again the phenomenon of uh, um, um, obedience, uh, disruptive obedience. In that's also something that's going to be maturing. People report being quite stressed. And, and as you've seen from the picture, now let's be clear, it's a movie meant by Milgram. So Milgram has a clever, clever chap that he was, made the movie the most, that was the most impressive as he could, right? So it's not exactly a depiction of the reality, <laughs> it's through the through an artistic bent. But still, when you look at the data, it's very clear. So it's very clear. That's of course the data from the first from four studies and the reported in the book. A large proportion of them report being extremely nervous. And it's very clear from actually, I've seen many clips from many replications. So there's a large proportion of people who are literally sweating <laughs> and, and, and shaking throughout the experiment. Now, it's important to distinguish the phenomenon from the explanation of the phenomenon. So what I've described to you is just a phenomenon. Right. I haven't told you why people engage in destructive obedience. And it's actually quite controversial. In fact, we don't really know why people engage in destructive obedience. Milgram himself didn't care at all for theory. He was just interested in phenomena. All his work is about, he has an interesting phenomenon about human beings. That's the way he made his career, and he was extremely talented at that. Um, but because he had to write some theory in order to get published, you know, you need a discussion section and an introduction, he came up with some kind of theory, which he calls the agentic step theory, which is theory between scare quotes, uh, which just misview ourselves as agent. So when somehow something removes our sense of agency, we, we view ourselves just as tool, and so we, we don't take ourselves to be responsible for the events. The very simple, very simple ideas. So, you know, the, the teacher is, does not view himself as an agent, so he does not, is, does not take himself or herself, but himself in the own experiment to be responsible for, for the behavior. It's quite a controversial theory. Many people think there's something wrong with it. An influential theory has been developed by Alexander Haslam that says it's really much more about the willingness to contribute to a common, to a common project. So psychologist, the learner and the teacher are part of a group that are contributing to a project, increasing the amount of knowledge, a scientific project that they view as being good. And that's why they're doing that. Today, it won't matter at all what the explanation is. I just wanted to mention it's controversial what the explanation is. We don't really know. What the question of this lecture is whether destructive obedience is a real phenomenon or not, whether much of you would be willing to hurt me if you were in that situation. Uh, and I'm sad to say that the answer is yes. <laughs> Now, the phenomenon has had an enormous impact both on science and on the broader world. Uh, it's part of every single textbook in psychology. You can't go to Psych 101 without learning about Midrash experiment. It's really basic psychology. Movies have been made about milligrams. Books have been made about milligrams. There's a 1995 movie about milligrams. There's a bunch of biography uh, made about his work, mostly driven by the obedience experiment. Well, I think the rest of his work is really quite remarkable. This is the obedience experiment that I've made him very famous. And not only that, the work has also been used beyond psychology to explain other phenomena. It's not just an explanet, an, an explanendum. It has been used as an explanet. So, for example, in this very important, very controversial book by Browning about why ordinary people engage uh, in genocide in Germany, uh, the main explanation is actually an appeal to Milgram, uh, an appeal to the phenomenon of destructive obedience. Not an accident, because Milgram himself, uh, from a Jewish family who suffered from the Holocaust, 
uh, thought about the whole study in light of, of what had happened in Germany. So it's not quite an accident that scholars much later also help themselves of um, uh, migrant migrant. Tremendous impact. The impact had been varying a little bit across time, ex extraordinary impact in the 1960s, 70s, slow down and re-emerge and so forth, as you would expect from any cultural phenomenon. And the lucky man, I'm not sure whether I want to, I'm running a little bit late, let me see. Really. So the lucky man not only had an impact on academia, also an impact on broader culture. Uh, one of my favorite albums of the 1980s by Peter Gabriel, it's a new wave album, so after he left Genesis, uh, uh, actually has a whole song dedicated to uh, to me, Graham. I see, I, I will have you listen to five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good music, so I think, yeah. There's a classic TV show that used that music in its season three. So if you don't know, if you don't know what it is, you can ask me the curator. Oh, one of the best, one of the best TV show ever made, used that music uh, for 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 a little while. It has connection with the US. <laughs> I want, I want to tell you. All right. Um, now, as soon as uh, the the '63 study was published, it became incredibly controversial. It was immediately noticed, not only by academics, but by the broader public. The New York Times had an op-ed about it. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch also had a long discussion of it, calling it open-eyed torture. So it was extremely controversial. Scientific American, which is a major journal of the APA, the American Psychological Association, uh, was um, uh, published an article by this uh, psychologist, Dania Baumbier, about the ethical violation that were uh, involved in the, um, the study. Namely, participants were lied about the experiment, and also they definitively were, at the very least, extremely stressed out by the, by the experiment. Milgram's membership to the APA was uh, held up for a year uh, as a result of the ethical inquiry on him until he was actually accepted within the APA. The controversy between Baumreed and a few other people led to the first formula the formulation of the first code of ethics by the APA. Uh, so it has a tremendous impact also on, on the sciences. There's a lot to be said here. Um, uh, in many ways, Milgram was actually in advance uh, compared to what was going on in time. He had, he had dispatched, he invented the post interview uh, uh, explanation and so on and so forth. So he did a lot of good things. Uh, but now, so the work has always been controversial. And what I want to be focusing on in the next 40, 35 minutes is this uh, discussion by Gina Perry, a book published in 2012. Also, I wanted to bring you, but also forgot it at home, which is a very systematic and quite nasty attack on Milgram's work. Uh, she has a bunch of objections. One of them is uh, 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 an ethical objection, you know, very much along the line of what I described earlier, arguing that participants were lied to and were harmed. Second, she has experiment, uh, uh, concerns about the uh, experimental design, saying that the assistant that you saw a bit in the clip was going beyond what he, was, what he had been told to do. He was actually pressuring participants mm -hmm. to uh, uh, behave one way. Okay. Uh, and the third one, which is the one we're going to be focusing on, is the infinity hypothesis. What does the infinity hypothesis say? It says that uh, Milgram's uh, experiments do not establish the reality of destructive obedience because participants just did not believe that they were harming anyone. They were pretending, they were playing along, they were going along with the psychologists, but they just didn't believe it. And of course, if you don't believe you're harming anyone, you're just going to go along and switch and, 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 pull, and pull the switch one after the other. And so the study uh, by Milgram and his uh, 18 studies published in the 74 books do not establish. It's a very influential book. It has led many people to think that Milgram should be removed from, uh, from, from textbooks, that uh, in fact, that uh, just, just, uh, obedient studies do not show that under minimal constraints, <coughs> people are willing to violate their own moral codes. <coughs> what I want to argue, uh, however, in the rest of this lecture is that, in fact, the uh, infinity hypothesis is dead wrong. 
uh, uh, there's a minimum bed of truth, but it does nothing to really undermine the reality of this story. Mm -hmm. right. uh, let me tell you a bit more about the inquiry hypothesis. Uh, uh, Perry got this idea by looking at two different types of documents. The first one, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, very quickly, uh, Milgram had done some debrief after the experiment. And when you look at the debrief, you also had a questionnaire to people uh, and to Swiss participants. And the participants sent, sent back the questionnaire to him. And when you look at, this is uh, what you can't see here, when you look at the questionnaire, at the participants' responses, you get things like that. I find it hard to believe that Yed would allow a paid subject to absorb such punishment. His refusal convinced me that it was an experimenter or an unshocked participant. So some people in their feedback do express disbelief with respect to the whole uh, experimental setting. Furthermore, we'll come back to that. She's going to use a survey that Taketo, don't worry, it's fine, that Taketo had, Taketo uh, Murata, who was uh, Milgram's, Milgram's assistant, had used. And in that survey, he had asked participants whether or not they believed that someone was harmed. I'll come back to that a little bit later. On, on, this, on the basis of these two sources of evidence, she argues that most participants were actually not credulous. They did not believe the experiment, and as a result, they behave in, the, in a way that shows, that shows nothing about their behavior. She has published the, uh, the same idea, not only in her book, but in a bunch of papers, which I'll comment on a little bit later. Notice that uh, this concern is not new, uh, the idea that participants were just not fooled by the experimental setting is not new at all. It was already discussed right after the publication of Milgram's first paper in 1968. And throughout the discussion of Milgram's work, people have had concerns about really uh, whether participants did actually believe that they were shocking someone. Uh, and in fact, when you think about it, it's a very natural objection, right? I mean, would a psychologist at Yale put you in a room and, and, and would you would you really be asked to give a 450 sh uh, volt shock to someone? That's something that strains credulity a little bit. Um, uh, so I think this is um, a reasonable concern. On the other hand, there's something quite strange about the hypothesis. I've shown you the video. People do seem to be quite stressed out. Uh, and if you look at many videos as I've done, there's definitely a large number of participants who had psychological stress during the experiment. Okay, I've told you about the experiment, I've told you about the objection. I want to, in the next few slides, do a slight detour, uh, because some of you might think that um, what we're seeing here, Milgram's work is part of this terrible social psychology that has been done until uh, the last decade, and has been decisively undermined by the replication crisis. So I think one question to ask is, is it part of this horrible trend in social psychology, horrible amount of work that we should actually discount and, and send in the dustbin of scientific history? The answer is no. Um, so that's example about psychology, example about uh, uh, the medical sciences, a concern about uh, the quality of science. The reason is no, because Milgram's study differs from uh, bad social psychology in at least three different ways, which are quite important. The first one is one characteristic about bad social psychology is that they tend to test unlikely hypotheses. So I don't know whether you know what this refers to. Um, uh, Vos, who is a very famous psychology, uh, had the hypothesis that working on a messy desk makes you more creative. <laughs> <laughs> on its face, an implausible hypothesis, and she got some striking data supporting this implausible hypothesis, and as a result of the paper in science or nature, whatever. Uh, so one characteristic of bad social psychology, now it does not replicate, as you might expect. <laughs> one characteristic of bad social psychology is a testing of unlikely hypotheses. And there's reason that the lower your priors are, the more you should be expected, a larger rate of false positive among significant results. Very easy to show. I won't do that, I won't do that, I won't do that here. What's, character, what's remarkable in uh, a mid experiment is that it's not implausible in this way. It taps into our experience of the world. That it is actually not that difficult to get perfectly ordinary individual with a normal moral sense to do horrible things. 
with minimum constraints. Uh, many of, of you know that uh, picture. It's, of course, in Nazi Germany. It's August Landmesser, who was one of the few people not to, uh, not to greet Hitler. Of course, he died in, in a camp as well as his Jewish uh, partner. Uh, but as you can see, everyone else totally happy to welcome Hitler. Uh, and it's before, of course, uh, it's quite early on during Hitler's, it's 1936, so quite early on during his, his dictation. So the hypothesis is not implausible in the way both hypotheses is. The second thing is one of the sources, of course, of um, uh, uh, bad science in psychology, anyway, I think the med medical sciences, is peer hacking, the manipulation of the data has to get significance. You know, you, you can see that when you just map, for example, the p-values or the z-value to a, a statistic, which are the same thing. And uh, you see, oh, 0 0.05 or 2.1, which would be the, the, the z-value for uh, a, a significant result, or uh, would be 1.96. Anyway, um, uh, just uh, around significance, there's a bump of, 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 uh, of, of good statistics, which means people are slightly pushing them around so they can just get the significance. Okay, let's go peer hacking. There's many ways to do that. Notice the remarkable things in uh, uh, Milgram's work. I've already shown you that slide. There's no P hacking because there's no P. There's no statistics. <laughs> and there's no P because you don't need a P. 26 people out of 40 go to 450 vote. You don't need, you know, it's a kind of experiment where statistics become utterly irrelevant. The phenomenon can be eyeballed. You don't need to run stats to discover very fine differences between very noisy measures. Um, so there's no room for key hacking. It's not just needed. And the second difference is replicability. Um, so those of you who have listened to me have seen that uh, figure many, many, many times. Psycholo social psychology doesn't replicate very well. One third of papers about maybe 40% of papers replicate. So the same is true of cancer research. I could have shown you the cancer research picture. It would be indistinguishable from, from that picture, the same graph exactly. Um, however, Milgram's experiment has a very good track record of replication. Uh, dozens of replication of that study in many countries. Now, what you find is this variation a little bit as you would be expecting in the number of people who are willing to harm, but that's just, norm it's just normal variation, right? What you don't find in the sequence of replication, I've read all of them, is that uh, a study where very few people engage in destructive obedience. Right? So, so, so proportion always vary. There's no study where only a handful of people engage in replication. So what we have here is what, what, what might and should have concerns about the work that Milgram has done, it's just not the, of the same type as the type of work social psychologists have done that has led to the replication crisis. If it has issue, it's a very different type of problem. Right. I just wanted to make that clear because there's been some kind of confusion about that uh, in the debates about Milgram's experiment in the last decade. People think it's just the same thing as the bad social psychology. So the so, second so small detour I want to do is to is to uh, say one or two things about the ethical objection. Uh, Perry really hates Milgram. I don't know why, but it's just throughout the book, you just feel <laughs> a deep distaste for the man. Uh, you know, she definitely uh, is out to get him. Um, and um, you know, I think there are more grounds to be concerned. What I want, and I think there are really more reasons to, to, be, to, object, to be objecting to um, um, Milgram's experiment. I'm going to be running a Milgram study very soon. Uh, but of a different kind. I won't be uh, shocking. Maybe one of you will be a volunteer, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in any case, I will be running a Milgram study. I can tell you a bit more about that later. Uh, but it's true that in the original study, many subjects seem to have been uh, stressed out. And here's what she says. For many of the subjects, there's an instrument of torture. And we can see why she says that here. Um, but on the other hand, it seems wrong. You can't really have it both ways. You can't say in the same book with a single mind, it's an instrument of torture, and participants don't believe it. <laughs> no, it's one or the other, right? If participants don't believe it, they're just pretend, you're engaging in pretend play, right? If you're engaging in pretend play, it's a bit of a bore, it's a bit annoying, maybe it's a bit, you know, I'd rather not be there. This is, this is ridiculous. But you're not going to be tortured. If you're tortured, it's because you believe it, right? So it's, the book is, has this massive inconsistency between her main objection, and she's so driven by her distaste for the man that she does not even see there's something that is at the very least attention 
if not an inconsistency between two positions. Anyway, I wanted to also make this ad hominem point about her work. All right, now I want to go back to um, um, uh, the incredulity hypothesis, which is the main focus of, on the paper. Uh, one of the sources of the discussion is that study here, which was done by Taketo Murata. As I mentioned earlier, Taketo Murata is um, that person right here um, in 2013, just 50 years after the, um, uh, the publication of the experiment. And what he did is that he sent participants a survey with a five point questionnaire asking them about their belief about the reality of the experiment. Did they believe that they were shocking someone? I fully believe the learner was getting painful shocks too. I was certain the learner, the learner was not getting shocked. And then there was a measure of how, of how often each of the, um, 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 of, uh, the number of shocks in that presentation of the data, it's dichotomized between obedience, which are the participants that went to 450 volts, and defiant, everyone who stopped before 450 volts. If you stop at 435, you're a different participant. Okay? And uh, um, um, Perry uses this data, as I will explain to you in a minute, to argue against for the incredulity hypothesis. Okay, that's, a, that's a main source of data. So that's Taketo Murata here uh, with a biographer of, of Now, the first thing to say is. I think this data should be taken with a grain of salt. I mean, they're retrospective data. They're not data measured during the study. It's years later, uh, Murata sends his survey, get people's feedback. So, you know, e every self-report should be covered with question mark. Retrospective self-report comes with two question mark. Retrospective self-report, when you harm someone, when you believe you have someone, comes with three question marks, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, you, you, you've you done something that you think is wrong, and then you ask, did you really believe it? Say, no, no, of course not. I did not, I did not believe that person, right? It's totally reasonable to think that what people are actually doing are providing excuses. I think it's worth keeping that in mind. But I will be bracketing that concern with introspective self-report. I will be taking them at face value. And what I will show you is that even if you take the self-report at face value, it's just not the case that um, most people believed, uh, it's not, not the case that you can explain away the study uh, by appealing to the lack of credulity of participants. Okay, there are many ways to look at the data. Here's one way he looks at the data. So she looks at this uh, 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 table and she says, look, so that's, all these numbers are for all the 18 studies that are reported in the 1974 book. So it's not just for one study, it aggregates across many variations of the obedience experiments, right? So uh, it's a bit mixing apple and apples and oranges to some, to some degree. But she looks at this and says, look, out of the 600 plus participants that took part in a Milgram's experiment, only 139 both were obedient, so went to 450, and fully believed that they were shocking someone. So it's really, if only 21 person, one out of five at most, really engage in obedience, destructive obedience. And from that she says, well, maybe that's a bit more than what we would like, but it's definitely far from the claim that the majority of us is actually willing to engage in destructive obedience. Okay, this is the first way to look at, at the data, and she does that in, in, the, in the book. Now, the first thing to say is, I think this, this quite misses the point of uh, Milgram's experiment. Milgram's experiment, the reason why it's interesting is because of the moral nature of the project. It's because whether you are easily willing to break what you think is the right, not to do what you think is the right thing to do. Now, if you believe that you're shocking some, someone, if you believe that we are probably shocking someone, if you believe that you might be shocking someone. In all these cases, I maintain it is wrong to shock someone. It's only if you're certain that you're not shocking someone that maybe it's okay not to, not, not, not to impose a shock. So from a, from a moral point of view, what really matters is not just that cell here. From a moral point of view, it's this, at the very least those three cells. I fully believe, I probably, I believe that I'm probably shocking someone, I believe I might be shocking someone. In any of these situations, if you're a decent person, 
or even if you listen person but not influenced by by uh, someone else you should not be shaking uh, and that brings us already to, to, to one, out, one, out, one out of three participants. But in any case, I don't think this is the right way to be thinking about the data. Not, not the space, it's just a first pass, I think. So the right way to be thinking is whether credulity has an impact on people's willingness to harm to the maximum, right? And that's very easy to test. You can just uh, correlate that. This is what I did here. You can just distribute the participants. We can show that are defiant, they stop before 4.50. So they might stop at 435, but they stop before uh, 450. And whether they're obedient, they go until until 450. This is a degree of credulity. Once means that they really believe that they are shocking someone, they're fully certain. Five, they're not certain at all. Probably, possibly uncertain. Certain. And what you can see is that there is a negative correlation between whether or not you believe that you are shocking someone and whether or not you are deviant. So here, the thing to say are two things. First, there's a grain of truth in what Perry is saying. If you're skeptical of the experiment, you're more likely to go along. If you really take it seriously, you're slightly more likely to, uh, uh, to be deviant, as it is here. Right? So there's a small grain of truth, that's the first thing to be said. But the second thing to be said, and I hope you see it right here, is that the effect size is very small. Well, it's small, right? So it is true that uh, when you are uh, really believing it, you're slightly, less like, you're slightly less likely to comply, but it's only just a very small effect size. And I think that just should settle the matter. Yeah? There's a true effect size, there's a true effect, but it's a very minute one. So you can't explain away destructive obedience by appealing to credulity. It doesn't in, in uh, Perry's work. Why doesn't it? Well, because she does some statistics. And here's it from a 2020 paper. So what she does in that uh, paper, the 20 paper, 2020 paper I mentioned earlier, is fit to a logistic regression model. Uh, the first model here and the second model here. So the first model takes whether or not you believe that you're harming someone and dichotomize it. So if you say one, two, uh, you believe, and you believe that you're probably harming someone, you get one. If you believe that you're certain that you're not harming someone and you say four, you get two. Number three are set aside, right? So you dichotomize the measure, okay? And then you do a, log a logistic regression by uh, uh, using this dichotomized measure of belief to predict defiance and obedience. And as you can see, you get a significant model here uh, with an odd ratio of 2.5, uh, which means the odd ratio that you're likely to, uh, the odd ratio between um, uh, um, harming or shocking if you uh, are uh, uh, um, uh, credulous and shocking if you're not credulous. I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm a bit impressed here. Uh, is 2.5, okay? It's, and it's significant. So there's something a bit fishy in removing part of your data, but I, I just, I just won't, won't, won't worry about that too much. And then she runs a second model, mostly because it's quite fishy to just throw one, one fifth of your data, but uh, she runs a second model where she includes all the data, all the five scale, it's also a logistic regression model. And what you can see, the model is also significant overall. And what you can see is that people who answer once, they're certain that they're harming someone, are significantly, significantly more likely to uh, shock than people who answer five, where people who are certain they're not hurting anyone. Okay? So she does some, uh, she does this two fairly simple uh, statistical analysis. And from that, she concludes that. Uh, the effect is highly significant, both statistically and substantively, and people's willingness to harm is strongly affected by their credulity and, 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 and uh, whether they're credulous or not. And you get dramatic variation. Uh, this is our conclusion. Let me explain to you because um, I, I will spend a, a couple of minutes on that. So what you have in red are just a summary of the data, another ratio of 2.15 in the first model. <laughs> And uh, another ratio of uh, 3.6 in the second model, okay, with respect to reference category. What you get in yellow are uh, gloss, a verbal gloss on that. Let me just read the first one, suggesting that those who had a high level of belief that the shocks were real were 2.57 uh, times, 2.57 times more likely to be defiant than those who had a low level. 2.57 times, that's a real effect. So credibility seems to matter quite a bit. And then you get, as, and yet you get to the things highly significant, both 
statistically and, and substantively. And she says the same type of ratio being said. For the, for the second model. Now, it does not fit very well with what I showed you earlier. Earlier, I showed you a correlation, a small correlation, a small effect size. Here we get 2.57 times. This is a huge effect. It's actually very worried. What's going on? Who is wrong? Right. She's wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, she to get the tweet. Uh, um, <laughs> it's as a mess as it can get. Um, okay, so the first thing to say is odds ratio are creature from hell. <laughs> they are creature from hell. No one understands them. You can't gloss them verbally without tripping in yourself. Uh, they are the output of uh, logistic regression. So that's what you report in a table. But you can't, they're, they're anything but intuitive. And, and, and they don't correspond to what you want to say mm -hmm. at all. So she does get an odds ratio, which is significant. And that's an odd ratio. It's a ratio of two ratio. That's the definition of an odd ratio in her case. But really, what she wants to tell us about relative risk, right? A relative risk is take, for example, it's a proportion in this case of different people among people who are credulous. It's a proportion of different people among people who are skeptical. This is a relative risk. Odds ratio are not that. Odds ratio are a ratio of ratio. Now, what you see in yellow is a gloss for a relative risk. So she's confusing in her description relative risks and odds ratio. So, uh, and that's why it's so impressive. A relative risk of 2.5, it's actually genuinely a substantive effect. And odds ratio of 2.5, of 2.5, it's actually not a genuinely very large effect. So she's actually, she does the same thing when she, she glosses over model two. She just confuses two different measure of effect sizes. And I can't blame her. Everyone does that. It's a very well-known issue with odds ratio. It's just, there's no way to gloss them verbally in a way that's easily communicable. But people think they see an odds ratio, people trust that it's relative risk, and then they get very excited. The second thing is that because she's confusing odds ratio and relative risk, relative risk she's misinterpreting how big her effect is. An odds ratio of two or even three, is actually not a very large odds ratio. Uh, a relative risk of two or 2.5 or three would be a very large, a very large effect. So here are just some number. Let's suppose you've got among your different people, 66% of credulous, 50% 50, 50 of skeptical. The odds ratio would be two. Relative risk would be 1.32. <laughs> if you've got 60 to 40, so there would be a, a, an effect of credulity on, on the behavior of, of deficiency. You know, it's, it's not a, a small effect, it's a real effect, but it's not enormous. You would get an odds ratio of three, which is larger than what she gets, and a, not, and a relative risk of 1.5. It's just to help you anchor your intuition about effect sizes there, right? As soon as you keep in mind the distinction between odds ratio and relative risk, what you find out is that what there is an effect, as I showed you by just doing a simple of correlation, the effect is genuine, but actually of quite small size. And so you can't explain away the incredulity hypothesis by just looking at people who are credulous versus who are skeptical. So what's the upshot of, of this uh, discussion is that there really is a genuine effect. You know, people who are credulous are actually more likely to just say no because the end of the experiment, but only a tiny so. Uh, again, this is just to give you a sense of effect sizes. Effect sizes are just very hard to intuitively grasp. This is effect size of Cohen 0.2. It means that between the two distributions of 83% of overlap. This is a Cohen effect size of 0.5. It means that between the two distributions of 67% overlap. We have an effect size of 0.3 if you look at the correlation. So it's much more like that than like this. So there is again an effect of credulity. It's a tiny effect. On, it's a small effect on people's willingness to harm or not. OK. The second, so that is the first type of data, uh, the, the survey. The second type of data she uses on is this um, uh, interviews that Milgram has done. And in the interview, people explain their behavior by the sense that the learner was not being harmed. And many people say that. The learner was not being harmed, that's why I kept going. No, the same concern about justifying yourself, providing an excuse for, for your behavior applies there as well. 
But I do think it's a mistake to use those data to try to support the infidelity hypothesis. Why is that? Like, for example, uh, Hollander and Chorovelsky. Because there's a confusion between harming and hurting. People know they're not harming. They're told like 5,000 times during the experiment, you're not harming the participants. But it's very clear that they believe they're hurting that person, right? And so, of course, the question here is that, is it morally acceptable to hurt someone, even if you don't harm her? Me thinks not. Uh, I don't know what you think, uh, but me thinks not. Um, um, so I think that's, that, that kind of data about not harming is totally irrelevant, again, for the infinity hypothesis. And the last type of data I wanted to mention that in theory is unfortunately not discussing comes from the book. These are the numbers from the 40, for the first four studies, it's about 139, uh, I think 130, about 130 participants. Um, and uh, this is various conditions mm -hmm. in the study. What uh, Milgram did is that post hoc, I believe post hoc, he sent them a scale or he had them feel a scale from one to 14. One being the participants feel no pain, 14 being the participants feel excruciating pain. And what you can see, this is the obedient participants, so we'll go to the end, this is defiant participants. And this is for all the various studies, uh, um, um, and that's, that's the mean. So there's no standard deviation, unfortunately, so I was unable to do a, a proper meta-analysis here of, of the data. I could have inputted some standard deviation, but I decided not to do it. What I just did for your uh, value if so that you can visualize the data. I just plot the data. This is the defiant participant. This is the obedient participant. This is the mean. And as you can see, there's basically no difference between between the conditions. So people believe that they're inflicting pain to the same degree, whether or, uh, independently of their willingness to uh, stop before the end or to go to go into the end. And again, that suggests people really were, were thinking they were harming other people. Conclusions? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> enough. Yeah, enough. <laughs> All right. To conclude, uh, Milgram's obedient studies are definitely not beyond ethical and methodological principles. I think there's very serious ethical concern with what he has done. I think it's a really genuine question. If you read the work, it feels very outdated in the way to do science. It's very narrative, no measure of uncertainty is reported. You know, it's, it's very amateurish in many ways. Uh, so it's actually very refreshing. Uh, you know, you say, oh, this is breezy, this is pleasant. <laughs> but definitely, uh, this is not one of these you know, formatted articles you would read this day in a social psychology journal. So there's a lot of exciting things in reading that kind of work. But it's definitely some very serious issues. Not reporting standard deviation when you report a mean. It's just bad form. Um, so there's many reasons to be very concerned about what uh, Milgram has done. Uh, but I do think that the infinity objection does very little to undermine, to undermine the usual interpretation of these studies. Um, um, and it does seem that, I think, unfortunately, uh, destructive obedience seems to be a real phenomenon that most of us, um, in, in fact, you know, 37 out of 40 in this room, uh, no, 20, 27 out of 40 in this room uh, are probably willing to uh, cause a maximum degree of pain to uh, someone under minimal constraints. Um, and I think this is actually quite a disturbing fact about ourselves that, we, that I think it's worth, it's actually worth knowing. I think this is the way we should feel when we read uh, that study and, and it's, it's for us, that's the truth about it. All right, before concluding, I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors on this uh, project, John Doris, who has actually the, uh, was actually the lead on this uh, uh, project. He got it started uh, to, uh, to get that uh, doing. If you have objections, uh, I'll give you his email. Uh, and uh, uh, Laura Nimi, who's a psychologist at, uh, at uh, Thornden uh, as well. All right, thanks for your attention. <laughs> All right, let's take a five minute break. Let's take a break and let's take a break.